According to the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, Wisconsin's rate of youth suicides is 30% higher than the national average. And 20 to 30% of Wisconsin young people do, uh, with mental health issues do not get the help that they need. Wisconsin I is at Sun Prairie High School to talk about the problem of mental health issues in Wisconsin's K-12 schools. And we have assembled a panel who have experienced or worked with this issue. And I want to thank uh, Sun Prairie High School for hosting us. And I want to introduce Connor Nicolay. He's a 2015 graduate of Sun Prairie High School who started a group, Still Human, that was aimed at promoting mental health after he dealt with some of these issues personally. Leah Esser is Director of Physical, Mental, and Behavioral Health for Madison School District. Steve Fernan is Assistant Director of Student Services, Prevention, and Wellness for the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Ann Wren is a counselor at Baraboo High School and a mental health first aid instructor. And Brian Dean, until Friday, was a social worker at Sun Prairie School District, and now he works for the State Department of Public Instruction. I want to thank you all so much for sure. coming to Sun Prairie High School to talk about this very important issue. Connor, you have shared your story. It's on the DPI's website. Can you give us the short version of your personal uh, struggles, sir? So the short version of my personal struggles with mental health started uh, in eighth grade. I was diagnosed with a generalized anxiety. And then sophomore year, I was diagnosed with uh, depression. Sophomore year, things were going well, but that's because I kept my mental health struggles hidden from my peers. And then junior year, that culminated after uh, months of struggling with an attempt to take my own life. Uh, after that, I talked to my parents and got help, and then decided I didn't want that to happen to any other kid. I didn't want any other kids in my school or in Wisconsin or anywhere to feel like they had no choice but to take their own life. So spring of that year, I decided to organize a seminar at Sun Prairie High School under the name called Still Human. After our first seminar in the fall of 2014, we decided that we didn't want it to be a one-time thing, that we wanted to continue our message. So Still Human is currently a corporation seeking its nonprofit status. Um, we look forward, we, our seminars focus on the three aspects of mental health education, uh, removing the stigma placed on mental illness and suicide prevention. Um, I'm here today because uh, certain peers of mine reached out and made sure I was all right, and we want to make sure that peers in other schools and in other areas can reach out to those who are struggling and not feel judged or ostracized from their school district. Connor, thanks very much. What I heard you say was anxiety to depression to a suicide attempt. Well, I think all of us on the panel want to know, how are you doing now, my friend? I'm doing phenomenal now. I'm a freshman at the University of Minnesota studying psychology with a pre-med track. Um, things are going very well there. Uh, my whole senior year I did very well um, once I was properly treated and started working on just like being more open about my mental health and not hiding it. Uh, it did wonders. I achieved better as a student and I'm very happy now with my life. Um, and how were you treated? Were you treated with drugs and counseling or just, yep. just uh, one more follow-up question? I was treated uh, in therapy and with medication. Uh, the combination of both really proved to work very well for me. Um, and currently as under control, I just go to, every once in a while I go to a maintenance therapy session just to kind of check up and speak with a psychiatrist uh, just to make sure things are staying all right. And six or seven years when Wisconsin, in, w w when Wisconsin I interviews you again, you're going to be what? A professional what? A uh, psychiatrist, let's hope. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Connor, for sharing that. So here's my question for any and all of the panel. Anxiety, depression to suicide. Is this a typical pattern of mental health dealing with some of our K-12 students? I don't care who goes first. Y'all can go. <laughs> Just thoughts? Well, I think it is. Um, recently, anxiety has actually uh, supplanted depression as the major mental health issue, at least according to a Dane County study. <clears throat> and we do, at times, you do see the, um, the the path going from anxiety to depression to suicide. Of course, there's exceptions. Um, completed suicides can be very uh, spur of the moment events, but um, certainly, certainly Connor kind of highlights the, the transaction that can happen from anxiety to depression to suicide. Anxiety, number one, Brian? I would say if you pulled most people in schools now, they would say anxiety is the number one mental health issue. Other panelists on that? Well, I'll just, I'll just add to that that uh, while the anxiety uh, may be uh, the top undiagnosed or even diagnosed uh, mental uh, illness that uh, students struggle with, that sometimes we don't really call it that. We don't really recognize that. We see sometimes misbehavior. And as a result, the reactions of the adults are to punish. Um, and that's part of what we're hoping can change. 
Connor talked about how he got the help that he needed and that his uh, illness was properly diagnosed and treated, but all too often we react to the behavior as opposed to what's underlying that. And so with that in mind, anxiety can sometimes be seen as, as misbehavior and chosen acting out. On the other hand, depression, well, if a kid is off in the corner by themselves not causing problems, we tend to sometimes let those kids disappear. So the real key in this is for not only uh, kids to be aware of and to come forward and ask for help, uh, but also for those of us who are adults who are uh, in positions to be able to intervene, to better be able to recognize those behaviors or those symptoms and to be able to intervene sooner and provide support. How do you walk a fine line between responding to a discipline issue and going beyond to sense whether there's some um, mental health sources of that? Uh, Leah or Ann, either one? In the Madison School District, we have um, shifted our policy around behavior to one that is less focused on um, zero tolerance or exclusionary discipline to one focused on progressive discipline that is characterized through the lens of equity and through um, the support of intervention. So it is the expectation of our schools that when a student engages in a behavior um, that impacts the learning environment, the expectation is that there's some level of assessment um, to understand their unmet needs or lagging skills matched with intervention um, to support the student. So that's one step that we're taking to dig a little deeper and to understand what's happening in kids' worlds. And yeah. please. Well, and I feel like some of what Connor alluded to as well as his transition and his progression are partially due to the stigma that revolves around mental illness, and especially for our young people in the schools. Teachers have been educated to educate and to teach. They've gotten very little mental health training. And part of what um, my colleague and I do with our mental health first aid is try to bring some awareness to that to the teaching staff. And they are openly, openly eager for this information because they don't have a lot of it. And, and partially that is because of the stigma, which is if we can start bringing some of that down, students like Connor won't struggle for so long with hiding it, as he said, um, not wanting to talk about it. And if we as educators are aware of it um, and know how to recognize some of those signs and symptoms, I think we can all help um, the Connors. Before I ask Steve about the uh, DPI program, the Wisconsin School Mental Health Project, put that on hold for a second, 27 district. Let me ask this generic or 10,000 foot question. Are mental health issues in our, our K-12 schools worsening? Uh, there's a lot of experience on the panel. Are they much worse than when you started in, in the classrooms or, or in the schools? Yes. In, mm -hmm. in, in, in which areas? Um, I think our student attendance was probably the first place that we started noticing it. Students weren't coming to school or they were coming to school and then having to leave school. And I think we all became aware of, obviously, there's something different going on. And when we reached out to the parents, that's when, and, and this has happened progressively, to find out what might be happening at home so that we could try to address some of the attendance issues or the behavior issues also, which came with those. Um, we were hearing, well, here's what's happening at home, which brought to light, I think, at least in our school district, that other things were going on with these young people and they weren't academic related and um, the attendance and the behaviors were because of things that they were dealing with that were going untreated um, or going unnoticed. Do you have the ability to ask what's going on at home if you have identified a student with mental health issues? Or is that a fine line? This is a question I just don't know yeah. the answer. Uh, how, how, how far can you go? I'm pretty brave. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more of a responsibility. Exactly. Yeah, responsibility? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you find generally parents are more receptive to talk about potential mental health issues with their parents? It can be. It can be difficult. The other thing we're seeing, too, is a younger age for onset, onset of mental health issues. That's fascinating, Brian. Elaborate, please. Well, so you, you, what used to be a, primarily a high school issue kind of over my career has gone down to middle school and even, you know, third, fourth, fifth grade. So part of your uh, responsibility is to catch some of those things a little bit earlier like Sun Prairie School District and Madison School Districts are part of a county program with Catholic Charities called uh, Building Bridges, where mental health experts are in um, and work with uh, younger students. And part of the idea behind that is to, uh, to break the stigma with families at an early age so you're getting treatment a lot earlier. 
Leah, can you talk about Building Bridges, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a collaboration um, between the county um, and the school districts with Catholic Charities supporting as the um, uh, organization that uh, supervises essentially the program. So um, in our district, students in grades 4K through 8 who live in the east um, attendance area feeder pattern um, can access the Building Bridges program. So we have one um, MMSD employee and one employee of Catholic Charities who support 12 to 14 students um, in a short-term case management model for 90 days. Uh, it's proved to be incredibly, incredibly helpful, very beneficial, outstanding um, initial data, um, and we're really eager um, about the possibility of um, expanding, hopefully here in January, with the addition of two positions from MMSD and two positions from the county. Is this, though, a program that uh, only Wisconsin's urban school districts might be in a position to fund and not some of the rural areas? I, I think times are tight with our budget in general, so it's really determining need and um, matching resources with that need. So I think for some of our more rural school, school districts, they are also seeing um, the same kind of need. Maybe it manifests differently. And so they are um, prioritizing some of their funding so that they can be able to match the county when the county is able to expand further. Yeah. I don't know what the intentions are. So can I come might... back to Connor a minute? Yeah. Connor, let's talk about your first um, issue was anxiety. Anxiety over what, sir? Uh, it's a generalized anxiety disorder, so it means it's over nothing specific. Uh, like, I don't have a social phobia or social anxiety where I get scared talking in front of people. It was just a constant worry, like this uh, sense of unrest and an inability to, inability to relax. Um, it wasn't over anything certain, and it wasn't over, like, events that normally give a high school kid or middle school kid stress. Okay. Like, I wasn't stressing out over who I'm going to take to a dance. I was stressing out over just minute things like not even being able to sleep at night because I was so wired and anxious. And then that grew to depression over some of the same issues? There was no single traumatic event in my life that led to my depression. It just seemed to be a development um, which created a chemical imbalance in my brain. Um, as it developed into a depression disorder, I wasn't, I was not uh, triggered by a certain event, like I said. It was just an overall sense of hopelessness that kind of started to creep over me. Each day things got a little bit tougher to get out of bed, to go to school, to apply myself. Things that I used to love doing just started to lose the, um, their like luster to me. I just wanted to stay inside, stay in bed, things like that. And that sounds like a pattern that all of, all of you are aware of. Mm -hmm. Well, Connor, and then you thought about, uh, you actually tried to commit suicide. Did you not feel you could talk to your fellow students, your siblings, your parents about this? Some of the professionals in the school, like Mr. Dean? How, so you were out there on your own personal emotional island, sir? Uh, yes, because of the stigma associated with mental illness. In the Dane County Youth at Risk survey that our school takes, 59% of students said they would look down on someone that they'd think that they'd look down, their peers would be looked down upon for receiving professional health treatment for mental health issues. Uh, that 50, was, now, come back to that. 59% of your peers said they thought they would look down on someone who what? Was uh, receiving help for mental health. Wow. So that was uh, a few years ago, though. I believe it was, um, it was our last cycle of doing it. And then after we implemented the Still Human program at our school, that number went down over 20%. So now less than half of our students and less than the Dane County average is uh, looking down upon uh, their peers for receiving mental health help. So we saw that with Still Human. But before that, I was extremely afraid to talk to anyone because of the stigma associated with it. Uh, I saw how they talk about it on TV and how like jokes like crazy and stuff like that are just made. Um, we ostracized people with mental health issues, and that's something I didn't want to experience. So I just pretended that everything was all right. And I just stayed doing the things that I did, just going through the motions but not really feeling it at school. And then finally closed in where you did attempt suicide. Yes, uh, closed in to the point where I was ready and about to do it, and then I actually had a last call for help to a friend, and he acted seriously upon it and had another peer come over, and then we talked to my parents about it and got help later that night. But the fact that it took that moment where I decided to take my own life to uh, shake me to talk to someone shows that we have a real 
uh, issue with mental health and how it's perceived in this country and even in this district or state. Steve, thanks for your patience. You yeah, were going to say? I just uh, wanted to go back to your original question about is it growing? And while some of my peers on the panel are feeling it is, and I, I think it very well may be, we don't really know because we haven't been collecting data you know, that is really comprehensive and insightful. And I think one of the things that uh, why we may be saying there is more mental illness uh, or, um, and uh, issues that we need to address is that we're finally talking about it. And what we've already said here on this panel is that the stigma that has existed for uh, forever uh, is something that we're starting to crack and that it is in my mind, very positive that we're starting to address, as Connor said, those negative images uh, associated with mental uh, illness and that we can speak openly about it, we can address those uh, topics, and we get help where it's needed. So in some ways, that's a very positive trend that we're saying it's on the rise because we're looking for it and we're trying to intervene. Now, can you please tell us about the new DPI program with 27 school districts called the Wisconsin School of Mental Health Project, sure. sir? Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a discretionary grant from the United States Department of Education under the Now is the Time Act. After the Newtown, Connecticut uh, tragedy at uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School, there were a number of uh, programs that Congress authorized, one of which was a school climate transformation grant that state departments of education could get. So our focus was twofold. One was to increase the amount of training available under the PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention and Supports uh, umbrella. But then in addition to that, to have a very special focus on school mental health. So with that, we've done a number of things. First is to develop a school mental health framework. It's a, a, a guidelines or document for looking at how we can approach mental health from a school perspective. Uh, secondly, we are providing, and we're actually in the development phase as we're taping this right now, development of a trauma-sensitive schools training approach. There will be 13 modules that all school districts in the state will be able to access so that their staff can be better aware of the trauma students may be experiencing or have experienced in the past that they're bringing to school and may be manifesting some of the behaviors that uh, we can intervene upon. But then more specifically, we're working with a number of pilot schools who are willing to implement that framework. Not only the training around trauma-sensitive schools, uh, working with a coach around uh, developing a school mental health framework, and then actually trying to implement that over three years uh, with our coach and the trainers. So we're excited that we can see some inroads as these schools develop their own capacity for addressing mental health, and then hopefully what we learn can spread to all school districts throughout the state. One thing that I'm so glad that we have the, the makeup of this panel is we have the city of Madison, we have suburban, and we have, is it fair to call Baraboo more rural than I the two? I think that's fair, yes. Yep. Is there then different responses? Does Madison have more capability, perhaps Sun Prairie, and then I want to hear about Baraboo. Leah, go ahead. Madison is not a part of the DPI grant, but we are also concurrently doing similar um, work. So we um, currently have three of our schools that have um, 0.5 or 50% of the, the week um, clinical practitioners that are in those school buildings. So in order for schools to be selected for that pilot, they had to really think about um, mental health in an integrated way. Mm -hmm. So thinking about this integrated system right. framework um, and, and integrating PBIS and mental health work. So our be pre behavior prevention and then supports for kids who have really intensive needs. Um, so we have, we have three schools right now and we are eager to expand, um, but it will be very important that we do that in a coordinated way with other Dane County um, schools. So we're working with the Sun Prairies and the Veronas to come together and to think collaboratively about how we utilize our limited resources in the most efficient and coordinated, comprehensive and collaborative way. Um. Brian, before I get to Ann, you've been at this school district, the, the, the school district for how long? Eight years. <clears throat> yes. So, um, do you have the same capability to respond to mental health issues that perhaps as Madison does? Do you think? Well, I think uh, each school district's. Uh, that's why the grant for the state's awesome. Uh, is that each school district's kind of doing it independently right now? So we have a few programs here. Uh, certainly, it's something we're looking to expand uh, further. Uh, we do. We screen all our sixth graders for trauma in their life and, and based on the results of that screening, put them into groups for anxiety or depression or trauma. 
uh, or grief and loss. Um, so we're all, all, I think all school districts are trying to um, address mental health and trauma um, just because they're seeing um, the results of, uh, of not addressing it for so long. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great trend for us. And then Ann and Baraboo, do, uh, do you have the same resources as a smaller district? We're, our resources are a little more limited, okay. um, but we do have a partnership with Lutheran Social Services where they bring in a, we have a therapist that comes into the high school specifically every Thursday and meets with identified students regarding any issue that might come up, but most certainly uh, most of them are anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues that they're, that they're dealing with on a daily basis. Um, we're also in the process of attempting to uh, train all of our staff with the mental health first aid so that they can all become aware of signs and symptoms that they may have thought previously were behavioral or um, due to something, you know, other than really what the deep seed might be. And by doing that, the teachers are really taking a different look at what's happening in their classroom and the interactions that they're having with students. And, and that's been a positive for us. We've heard great things from the teachers that have been through the training and are able to say, I think I get it now. I, I see I can handle that student differently rather than immediately going to the discipline piece yeah. of it. Connor, you said 59% of students said they would well, f finish that stat. They believe that they would look down upon someone for receiving uh, professional help with mental health issues. Was that uh, of uh, high, what, ninth through 12th grade students? Ninth through 12th grade students, yes. Does that stat surprise anybody here? And Brian? disappoints. Yeah. But, uh, um, are you surprised? And well, uh, are you surprised at the stat? Question number one. And do you think um, we're getting better at that? In other words, maybe it was seventy percent a few years ago. Now it's fifty-nine. Maybe we can all hope it'll be forty. Anybody on that? I'm surprised and disappointed. I think programs like the one that Connor started in our school and took around the uh, the county and the state last year, the Still Human program, is one way to really address that. I think he made great strides for us. Let's go back. Let's talk about Still Human. So the goal of it was to begin a dialogue on some of these mental, mental health issues, Connor? Yes. Uh, we provided educational seminars uh, to peers and myself. My peers are Ashley Unmacht and Ryan uh, Newquist. They were both seniors here with me. And this all just kind of started as, like I said, a one-time presentation focusing on the three main aspects of mental health education. So educating kids on what mental health is, um, different mental illnesses, and things like that then suicide prevention, and removing the stigma placed upon mental illness. So just kind of debunking some of the myths that's like, oh, if someone has an anxiety disorder, they're crazy, or something along those lines. So we provided them with some statistics to help disprove those, uh, those misnomers. So Still Human Now is presented at uh, over five different schools um, and talked, have worked with other student organizations to help them implement different mental health uh, plans. It has just really been, like I said, to focus on those three main points, uh, mental health education, suicide prevention, and removing the stigma placed on mental illness. How did you get, we just heard a bell, so I assume class, classes changed. How did you get the attention of the students that just changed classes at Sun Prairie High School that this is an issue in their very busy lives that they ought to pay attention to, Connor? Um, we offered it as a free come as you will seminar. Um, <laughs> In October, we were doing WKCE testing, and the juniors and seniors at the school did not have to come in early, but we said, hey, we'll be hosting a mental health seminar, come on in. So we had uh, between 100 and 200 kids show up, something we were very proud of, because we know how much uh, juniors and seniors like their sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. Having the chance to wake up at a normal time compared to sleeping in isn't something that draws a lot of people. But giving them statistics, like one in four adolescents have a diagnosable mental illness. Um, and just statistics like that, we took statistics from our own school and uh, D Dane County and just told those to the students while like telling my narrative as well. So it's not something that they uh, is faceless to them. It's something that's a lot of times it was my peers that I presented to. So it's uh, mental health and struggling with mental health now has a face. And it's something that's not a distant problem. It's something that's actually in their school. So that's something that really helped. Um, once we did our first presentation, I shared my story. A lot of kids started talking to Ashley, Ryan, and I, telling them that, oh, um, I have mental health issues too, and we talk to them and urge them to get help. And just stuff like that is the real reason that we started it, because we don't want, 
like I said before, we don't want a kid to feel ostracized and alone, that the only choice they have left because of mental health is to take their own life. We want them to be able to get treatment easily, uh, to not be afraid to talk about it. Things along those lines are just so important to us at Still Human and to all these educators on this panel. It strikes me that the Still Human program is um, proactive, playing offense, if you will. Uh, are Wisconsin schools getting better at being proactive and yeah. not yeah, you've heard a number of, yeah, you've heard a number of examples already here from the panelists. PBIS, Youth Mental Health First Aid, uh, the, the cooperative partnerships we have with community agencies, the peer programs, trauma-sensitive schools. The Bridges program. Right, uh, yeah, right. So all of those uh, approaches are really starting to crack that stigma uh, that we talk about, that uh, what you know we saw in um, Connor's uh, school's uh, survey is that even in one survey cycle that started to erode. This is very new in terms of the approaches and the emphasis we've been placing on these trainings. And by changing adult attitudes, and children can mirror us and they tend to reflect <laughs> us, uh, I think we can see a sea change by uh, changing the adult attitudes first and, and erasing some of the stigma, and then hopefully we'll see that uh, uh, we can erase this from this generational issue that we've seen. So I think, again, it's encouraging. Um, reading from a DPI press release on this issue, we've talked about anxiety, depression, and suicide. Some of the other issues, violence, homelessness, loss or fear of loss of loved ones, uh, these are all additional things that, that you've seen. Anybody want to elaborate on on any of those factors? No? Okay. I think it's just Leah, important please. to note the significant um, amount of barriers or challenges that our, that our students do face. And what I think is most critical as educators is that we stop and pause long enough to say what's happening in their world and what do they need um, in order to, to, to be supported. Um, I think any factor, homelessness, et cetera, is going to increase a student's level of stress, uh, all of those pieces, thus, um, thus resulting in um, higher risk for um, mental health needs or, or un, untreated needs or less balance um, during times of transition or stress. A classroom teacher who feels that um, uh, she or he has a student with mental health needs, what sources or what referrals can they can they make we unfortunately don't have a social worker in our district so our school counselors are really our go-to's for the teachers and they're they're aware of that and so the counselor would be their first resource to go to um, and discuss issues that they might be seeing I think with any one of their students um, are uh, the the parents most of them obviously have, have health insurance are uh, is this covered by private health care that's another naive question on my part is it that's a barrier. Uh, I think, uh, I think it's, a barrier. So it, it's a it's a barrier, but it's also something that our providers um, are eager to um, discuss and engage in conversations. So um, the HMOs um, and other providers within the city um, have have taken the time in Madison to have these conversations about how to improve access because insurance is is and can be a barrier to care um, it, just in the sense that it takes a lot longer for kids to be seen or um, the, the steps that have to be, the steps that a family would have to take in order to engage in that care are, are relatively complicated. Is the growing sensitivity and responsive to K-12 mental health needs, is that statewide? Um, we're here in Madison, but if we were taping this, you know, 200 miles north in some very rural districts with some major problems, mm -hmm. uh, are they uh, also becoming more sensitive, Steve, as a DPI representative? They are, and while many of those districts have engaged in the PBIS initiative or other things that are available, many of them do not have uh, agencies or private practitioners in their community. Some of these rural uh, um, communities, it may be 30 to 50 miles where there's a mental health professional. So with that, they've had to be more innovative. And I think as we continue to develop this mental health framework, uh, they might have to choose a different model. We may not be able to set up a school-based mental health clinic because there aren't clinicians nearby that can work in that school. Or the same thing with having a collaborative uh, agreement with an agency that may be, again, 30 to 50 miles away, we may have to instead focus on building the capacity of the staff that are there. 
through training them to be better at screening, uh, better to uh, uh, do short, brief interventions. So those are the types of things that you'll see differently in the rural areas, is there might have to be a different approach because the resources just aren't there to partner with, like they might be in uh, population-dense uh, uh, communities in Wisconsin. How often do you get the response of the parents, there's nothing wrong with my kid? And are you getting that response less than 5, 10, 15 years ago? Anybody? I don't get that very often when I really? speak with a parent. Generally, they're thankful that someone has reached out and said, "What can we do to help?" Um, and that they're more—they maybe haven't—they haven't realized what their resources are either. And, and to have the school reach out where their student is the majority of the day um, is generally looked at, at least with our experience, and unbearable. They've probably already been struggling with the issue with their child, and so they're not really surprised when we contact them. I think they're more, like you say, relieved mm -hmm. that somebody else is recognizing this is a need and offering some ways to, to address it. Well, one of the central questions that I had, and one, one reason I set up this show, is help me understand why youth suicide rate in Wisconsin is 30% higher than the national average. Please. There's a number of hypotheses, Steve. One is that we have a higher than a national average both adult and youth binge drinking rate and the disinhibition that comes with uh, alcohol use is certainly a part of it. When someone's struggling with uh, uh, anxiety, depression issues and they're self-medicating with alcohol, uh, having that uh, alcohol be involved in making a decision is certainly a factor. Secondly, we have uh, some of the highest um, uh, gun ownership rates and I'm a hunter myself so nothing against that it's part of our culture but the fact that you have access to le lethal means uh, when somebody's struggling and maybe alcohol and drug involved is another uh, factor for it and the last thing is that Wisconsin has among the lowest rates of mental health practitioners that have as their specialty an adolescent population. So when we think about uh, not only having significant needs like, like there is everywhere, but then not having the specialist practicing in Wisconsin combined with our high binge alcohol use rate and access to lethal means, it's a, a kind of a concoction that has made Wisconsin have uh, uh, youth suicide being the second leading cause of death among our students aged 5 to 19 over the last 13 years compared to uh, in, uh, nationally it's the third highest rate. So I think all of those combine and contribute to that factor. Connor, do you have any PS on, on what, the, the binge drinking and the access to guns? Uh, do, 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 does your gut tell you that's those are major factors, sir? I feel like it definitely could be. I mean binge drinking, being under the influence while making a choice, uh, especially one that is as rash as uh, suicide could easily be a big factor. Same with uh, access to firearms and such. Just those are things that I know when I was placed upon suicide watch, uh, anything that could be used as harm, including like butter knives and stuff was taken away. So having access to a gun or to like alcohol to increase the chance of that decision, uh, just are small factors that I could see as uh, why we could be three times higher than national average. Another DPI stat, only between 20 and, 20 and 30 percent of young people with mental health issues get the help that they need. My question is what happens to the other 70 or 80 percent? I think they reach out as best they can and hopefully we, the, they can find the resources that they need. Um, but that, that definitely many of these kids are learning to cope with these things. Fortunately our youth are resilient, that they all have some sort of resiliency in them. But again, I think the more we can be talking about it, the more awareness the more training we can do where our adults that are in these young people's lives can recognize some signs and symptoms um, that will help take the stigma away if we talk about it and we use appropriate literacy as I thought Connor's you know, saying the word crazy and using appropriate words that, that are more acknowledging the fact that this is a disease just as cancer is, um, that will help all of our youth in our neighborhoods and in our communities. As school districts statewide, I think there's 424 school districts, as they prepare the next budget, uh, especially with the constraints, the, the fiscal constraints, um, is there support growing for mental health programs or is it increasingly, yeah, but we're not going to have, it's the choice between classroom size and mental health programs. So how's that debate I going? I think that that will continue to be the challenge. I think this greater awareness 
that many students struggle um, and that they're uh, in need of support and services uh, isn't unnoticed, but at the same time there is that struggle with, uh, I think Ann said it earlier, our educators are supposed to educate. Well, how do we balance that with our mission uh, to provide instruction on English and math and because we have high stakes tests that are also facing us. So I think it will continue to be a struggle and we know that uh, one of the results of budget cuts is we've lost disproportionately more pupil services staff than many other uh, uh, roles in school. So hopefully we've at least uh, stemmed the tide on that and we don't see any further loss. I think one of the things that may have to happen though is if we don't have the ability to increase those pupil services staff that we at least can reach out and create those partnerships. You heard a couple of examples on the panel here. We're very innovative. Uh, our partners and community-based agencies are stepping up and working with us and I think that is likely going to be one of the solutions uh, to uh, addressing this issue going forward with tight budgets. Leah, is the Madison School District spending more on mental health issues over the last years? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have, um, over the course of the last five years since I've been in the district, expanded um, the access to mental health supports um, for our students. Maybe not necessarily therapy or a clinician, but some level of continuum of services and supports for, for students and families. Also true in um, Sun Prairie and Baraboo, Brian? It is in Sun Prairie, yes. That, 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 that it's increased. And, yeah, and we're doing more and more trainings as often as we can with our staff. Those teachers, those classroom teachers, mm -hmm. they're dealing with an awful lot. Now you're making them sensitive to mental health issues. Where do they find the time? I mean, how do you, that's just a priority issue, right? Mm -hmm. But they are welcoming the idea that they have to become better at responding to some of these mental health issues. It's easier than responding to the behavior that results from a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's less challenging than that. So. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time. Maybe a fitting question for each of you is this. What advice would you give um, students who feel they have a mental health issue, parents of those students, and classroom teachers who are interacting with, with a student or, and school administrators who may be... Uh, responding to a mental health issue in a, in a young student. You want to go first, Brian? Well, I think Connor's story really highlights it. Um, he went to a peer first. So pro programs like his that reach out to peers, let peers know it's okay to uh, get help for a friend, would be a good place to start. So staff, like student services staff, need to be able to listen openly to peers that come in and want to share about a, a friend. And then also the parents will need to be open in listening about the concerns the school has about the, the child. And then um, also staff and uh, administration need to be open-minded and listening. I do want to mention one more group of people that we haven't touched on specifically, but um, lesbian, gay, bi, and transgendered youth are uh, three times as likely to be depressed and seven times as likely to attempt suicide. And so that's another group that we need to reach out with, with some peer programs like Gay Straight Alliances that many schools already have. Okay. You, thanks for that advice. Mm -hmm. And please. Compassion and literacy. Um, and I think letting these young people know that there is hope. Um, giving them that hope and letting them know that, that there, is, there is help out there. Um, people like Connor maybe didn't realize that until he had the opportunity to talk about it. So Thank you. Steve. We need courageous people like Connor and parents and administrators to speak up and uh, uh, tell the truth about this issue for them and for what they're observing so that we can change that stigma. We can change adult attitudes that in turn will reshape uh, adolescents' attitudes about mental health and mental illness and that ultimately by being honest and by addressing that stigma we can get the help that we need. And a lot of the programs that are out there with the partners that we have uh, can have an impact and we have to explore what's best for our community and uh, I think we'll see that over the next few years. Leo, please. Um, so thinking about this work from two lenses, the, the more 10,000 feet lens, the systems lens, and then um, the individual students. So from that systems lens, I would just say that it is critical to think about developing your multi-tiered system of support and not just supporting one student at a time. We need to make sure we have systems and structures in place in our schools um, in support of all kids. 
And then from a more humanistic standpoint, I think the importance of advocacy, um, supporting students to develop their voice. I think as grown-ups, we often think we have all the answers and we spend a whole lot of time in meetings when we could ask a kid and they could solve the problem for us a lot more quickly. Um, so engaging that student voice and then I think if there's anything that I would say, it's helping all of those who interface with our kids to understand that behavior um, is a result of unmet needs or lagging skills and it is our job to support them to meet those needs or to develop those skills. Okay, Connor, here's the wrap up for you. There are students out there hopefully watching this who are dealing with some of the same issues that you did, anxiety, depression, the threat of suicide. Bring it. What's your message? Our tagline that we close every seminar with is, uh, no matter what you're going through, you are still human. So never feel alienated from those around you. Never be afraid to talk about uh, what you're going through, whether it's mental health related or just family problems, school problems. Just never have that fear of reaching out to people around you because that doesn't make you weak. It makes you smart. It makes you want to get help and survive. So just reach out and never be afraid. I said that was a final question, but maybe I have one more. In this, re, re, in, in, in dealing with mental health, mental health issues, excuse me, in K-12, glass half full, half empty. Brian? A little more than half full. And full. 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 Yeah, we're working on it. Yep. Definitely more than half full. Absolutely. We, we're making strides. We've got a half full glass at least. Mm -hmm. What do you see? My I'm going to be honest, I never understood that expression, so <laughs> <laughs> don't really know. I love it. It's a generational <laughs> thing, and I'm so glad for his answer. Connor, thank you so much. Thank Leah, you. Thank you so much. Okay. Steve, Ann, Brian, I really appreciate you talking about a subject that uh, all of Wisconsin has to understand better. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks thank to you. Sun Prairie High School for hosting us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.